In the last video, we saw that the frequency of bond vibration can be thought about like a spring oscillation. And so it's dependent on two things. It's dependent upon K, which is the spring constant or the force constant, and the reduced mass, where the reduced mass is equal to the mass uh, M1 times M2 over M1 plus M2. And so here's your bond as a spring with M1 and M2 on either end. And so if you increase the force constant, right, increase the spring constant, so that's like increasing the strength of the bond, obviously you would increase the frequency, just looking at the math here. So you increase the frequency of bond vibration. And so a stronger bond, a stronger bond vibrates faster than a weaker bond. And also if you, if you decrease the reduced mass, right, so if you decrease the reduced mass, mathematically that's also going to increase the frequency of vibration here like that. In the first video, we talked about relating the frequency to wave numbers, right? So the wave, a wave number, you take the frequency, divide by the speed of light in centimeters per second. And so if you take this and take this over here and just divide by the speed of light, which is C, you're going to get uh, wave numbers. And so this is, a, this is good to use to approximate the wave number where, we, where you would find your signals in, in IR spectroscopy. All right, there's one more thing we have to do though to get the proper units for wave number and that's because here the reduced the reduced mass is in grams and so we need to make that atomic mass units or amu and so we can divide by avogadro's number to get that so i'm not I'm not too concerned with with units here i'm just going to show you real quickly where this equation comes from so wave number is equal to one over two pi c times the square root of k over the reduced mass and to get our proper units we have to divide by Avogadro's number which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. All right, so let's uh, let's continue here. That'd be one over two pi c times the square root. I'm gonna make a little bit of a long square root sign here because we still have the uh, force constant over the reduced mass. And now we could just move Avogadro's number up to the numerator here. So that's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Let's go ahead and find the square root of Avogadro's number, all right? So the square root of Avogadro's number is equal to, so we have square root of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And we get that number is 7.76 times 10 to the 11th. So let's go ahead and, and write that down here. So now we have wave numbers equal to 7.76 times 10 to the 11 divided by 2 pi. C is the speed of light in centimeters per second. That's 3 times 10 to the 10th. And then we still have we, we still have the square root of the force constant over the reduced mass. So let's go ahead and, and solve it even further here. We need to divide that number by two. We need to divide that number by pi. And we need to divide that number by the speed of light in centimeters per second. So divide by three times 10 to the 10th. And we get 4.12. And so we arrive at this, this uh, this wave number is equal to 4.12 times the square root of k over the reduced mass. And so here we have a nice little equation where we can approximate the wave number for different bonds. So where we would expect to see the signal for different bonds stretching. And let me use a different color to point these things out here. So k, call this the spring constant or the force constant. The units are dynes per, dynes per centimeter. And then we have the reduced mass here in AMUs. And so let's, let's do some calculations. And so let's see if we can approximate where we would find the signals uh, for some bonds. And so let's get some more room down here. And let's start with, let's start with a carbon-hydrogen bond. So we have a carbon-hydrogen bond here. First thing we could do is calculate the reduced mass. So the, the reduced mass is equal to atomic mass of carbon is 12. Uh, mass of hydrogen is 1. So 12 times 1 over 12 plus one, and we did this calculation in the previous video, and we got 0.923. So we're gonna plug this into our equation for wave number. So wave number is equal to 4.12 times the square root of the force constant, 
for a single bond, right, we're talking about a carbon-hydrogen bond here, it's a single bond, you can use a force constant of five times 10 to the fifth dynes per centimeter. And we're gonna divide that by 0 0.923, the reduced mass. And so let's get out the calculator and do that calculation. All right, so we have five times 10 to the fifth. We're going to divide that number by, by 0.923. We're going to take the square root of our answer here, and then we're going to multiply that by 4.12. And this gives us 3,032. So 3,032 wave numbers. So 3,032 units would be one over centimeters. And so this is, this is what we calculated, right? So this is the approximate wave number. So this is approximately where you would find the signal for a carbon-hydrogen bond stretching. So if you're looking at an IR spectrum, and the actual signal is, is pretty close to this number, so this is a good approximation, and that's why it's kind of useful to use this equation here. Let's do it, let's do it again for carbon-oxygen. All right, so still a single bond, but this is carbon-oxygen this time, and so the reduced mass is going to change. But the force constant is gonna stay the same because in both cases, Right, in both cases, we're talking about a single bond here, so we're going to pretend like they're exactly the same strength, which, which uh, just to help us for our calculations to approximate things. All right, so the reduced mass would be equal to carbon is 12, oxygen is 16. So we have 12 times 16 over 12 plus 16. And let's do that math really quickly. So we have 12 times 16. Right, which is 192 divided by 28 gives us about 6.9. So we're gonna say the reduced mass is approximately 6.9. And let's calculate the approximate wave number. So where would we expect to find this signal? So 4.12 times the square root. We're gonna use the same number, right? We're gonna use five times 10 to the fifth. So we're saying we have a single bond here. So again, these are just approximations. So this is five times 10 to the fifth. Going to divide that by the reduced mass, which is 6.9, and let's see what we get for the wave number. So let's do that math. All right, so we have 5 times 10 to the fifth. We're going to divide that by 6.9. We're going to take the square root of our answer, and then we're going to multiply by 4.12 to get the approximate wave number, which is 1109. All right, so we have one, one, zero, nine, one over centimeters for our wave number here. And let's compare these two wave numbers. So what did we do in our calculations? So let me use, uh, let me use, let me use blue here. So what did we do? We, we switched out a hydrogen, right, for an oxygen. So we increased the mass of the second atom, or the, or, the, or the nucleus, if you want to think about it that way. So you increase the mass of the second atom, and what happened to the wave number? Right, the wave number decreased. We went from 3,032 to 1,109. And notice what we did, right? The reduced mass was 0.923, and it went up to 6.9. So we increased, we increased the reduced mass, and we decreased, we decreased the frequency or we decreased the wave number. And so again, this is approximately where you would find the signal for a carbon-oxygen single bond. Not exact, because obviously we're just using really, really simple numbers here, but it's pretty close. All right, let's do a carbon-carbon double bond now. So carbon-carbon double bond. Let's calculate the reduced mass. The reduced mass would be 12 times 12 over 12 plus 12. And when you do that math, you're gonna get six. So I think we did that in the previous video too. So let's, uh, let's plug this into our equation. So the approximate wave number would be equal to 4.12 times the square root. All right, so what are we gonna plug in now for the force constant? Well, we have a double bond here, right? We have a double bond, so a carbon-carbon double bond. And if we just approximate and say that a double bond is twice as strong as a single bond, right? we could just take this number and multiply it by two. 
right? And so that would be 10 times 10 to the fifth. So we're just saying that a double bond is, is close to being twice as strong. And again, not a, perfect, not a perfect number, but it's a good approximation. And it just gives us an idea about where these wave numbers come from. So now we solve for the wave number, the approximate wave number here. So we have 10 times 10 to the fifth. We're going to divide that by six. We're going to take the square root of our answer, and then we're going to multiply by 4.12, and this is going to give us uh, somewhere around uh, 1682. All right, so our calculation gives us 1,682, where we'd find uh, where we'd find the signal. Again, not perfect, but a decent approximation. Right? Not a perfect, not a perfect number, but pretty close to where you would find the signal for a carbon-carbon double bond on an IR spectra. Let's do one more. One more. Let's get some more room down here. So let's see if we can squeeze in one more calculation. Let's do a carbon carbon triple bond. So a carbon carbon triple bond, the reduced mass obviously would be the same as above at 6. So we're going to be changing the force constant here. So the wave number would be equal to 4.12 times. So what would we plug in for the force constant now, right? Well, it's, this would be, right, this was double a single bond. So we need to go for triple a single bond. We have a triple bond here. So 3 times 5 times 10 to the fifth. Right, so that's 15 times 10 to the fifth. So this would be three, we're approximating this, saying it's three times as strong as a single bond, 15 times 10 to the fifth. We're gonna divide that by six. All right, and let's, uh, let's see what happens now. So we have 15 times 10 to the fifth. We're going to divide that by six. We're going to take the square root of our answer once again. So the square root of our answer. And we get 500, we multiply that by 4.12, and we get 2060. So we get 2000, 2060 here for the wave number. All right, so however you want to write this. So what happened? What happened between these, this last two examples here? What we increased K, right? That's the only thing that changed between these two calculations. We increased K, we increased the force constant. We're saying a triple bond is stronger than a double bond. And what happened to the frequency, right, or the wave number? The wave number increased, right? So increase K, you increase the frequency, you increase the wave number here. Finally, let's, uh, let's plot these on an IR spectrum. So let's first start with uh, the carbon-hydrogen single bond. So somewhere in the 3032. So let's go down here for, for our IR spectrum. So 3032, 3, so that would be somewhere around in here. All right, so this would be approximately where we would find the signal for a carbon-hydrogen bond. And this just allows us to think about regions of our IR spectra. So somewhere in this region, right, in this region right in here, is where you would find a bond to hydrogen. So we just, we just said this was carbon to hydrogen here, but you could generalize this by saying it's, it's any bond to hydrogen because it's the hydrogen, it's the smaller mass that causes the increased frequency, the increased value for the wave number. Let's look at our next one here. Let's look at let's look at carbon oxygen, right? So for carbon oxygen, we have 1109. And so that's a big difference. It's a single bond, right? 1109, that's that's way down here. So 1109 would be somewhere somewhere around in here for this carbon oxygen bond. And so it turns out that this region right in here is where you find it's a single bond region, right? So this is the single bond region when you're not talking about hydrogen. So this would be the single single bond region. This over here would be the uh, the bond to hydrogen region. And then we have uh, we have two more two more regions to talk about, right? We have our double bond region. Let's use green for that. So carbon carbon double bond. We calculated it's approximately 1,682 wave numbers. So let's find that on our spectrum here. So 1,682. So that would be that would be approximately in here. So this would be this would be like six somewhere in there in that range. And so we could say that's approximately where we find the signal for a carbon-carbon double bond. And your, your double bond region, right? So let me write double bond region. Double bond region is right around in that, in that area. So double bond region. Expect to see a signal for a double bond in this area here. So somewhere, somewhere in here, right? So this is approximately your double bond region on IR spectrum. 
And then finally, our last thing that we're going to think about is our triple bond, right? So our triple bond, we calculated an approximate value for a carbon carbon triple bond. We got 2060. So 2060 would be somewhere in here, right? So that's approximately where we'd find our triple bond region. Right, and that usually does go about about uh, 2,100 to 2,300, so in here somewhere, so pretty small, but just to give you an idea of these different regions, so here's the triple bond region, so triple bond. And so hopefully, hopefully that allows you to think about why you get these different, uh, you get these different wave numbers, right? It has to do with two factors. It has to do with the force constant, and it has to do with the reduced mass. And if you think about those two factors, right, you can think about where the signal uh, should appear for these bonds, for these bonds stretching. So you can figure out the approximate wave number, and you should know these wave numbers because it's going to help you when you read your IR spectra.